Well, good morning, Sturgeon Alliance. Uh, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. That's straight out of the book of Psalms. And we're going to open God's word this morning. And, and it is going to be a light unto our path this morning. Uh, if you have your Bibles, you're going to need it this morning. It, it, we're in Proverbs chapter 5, if you have your Bibles. What well, we're going through Proverbs, it was a series called Wise Up. And on most of these Sundays that we've been going through Proverbs, we've been kind of picking and choosing these, these, these verses on a theme that, that the Father speaks to the Son, all kind of like dribbled all throughout the book, and we kind of make them into a snowball and, and a package. But today, uh, today the, the, the topic that we're going to talk about is all kind of condensed into one area, Proverbs chapter 5, 6, and 7. So open your Bible up, and we'll, we'll get there in a moment. Uh, um, one of the feedbacks, one of the things that I hear from, from people uh, about my, my preaching is that, that you love how passionate I am about something. Like we're in the book of Revelation, you just love how passionate I am about God's word. Well, well today, uh, we, we're going we're gonna to talk about a subject that, that, that I'm passionate about, trust me, you can ask my wife. Uh, but, it, but it's a subject that is, is, is one that I do not like to speak about. It's, I'm, I'm kind of in this cognitive dissonance today. I, I, I'm passionate about it, but I don't like to speak about it. Uh, today's sub subject is, is sex. <clears throat> uh, and and you, can you can see my, my, he my hesitation here. Uh, um, they say that and I would agree with this, that, that a pastor's least favorite subjects to talk about are money and, and sex. And so we've been in the book of Proverbs, and the last time I preached to you, Josh did two weeks on our tongue and our mouth, uh, and the words that we say are excellent. The last time I spoke to you, I, I spoke on money. Two weeks on money, and then today we're, we're on sex. And I was like, Lord, we just finished Revelation. That was tough now. Come on, come on, give me a break. But the, but the Lord led us to Proverbs, and so that's why we are, that's why we're, we're talking about this. Because when you get to the book of Proverbs, this subject is front and center. I mean, it's not, in a, if you've read it, if you've been reading a chapter a day for a month, like we're asking everyone in our church to do for May and June, uh, the, the, this isn't kind of an appendix stuck at the bottom, a little obscure verse. This is a subject that the Father speaks to the Son about at great detail. In fact, this past week is, is uh, what is it, the seventh, eighth today? I can't remember. Uh, anyway, you've read the first few chapters, uh, and, uh, and, and a lot of them, if you're posting a proverb online, you're like, oh, that's a little bit embarrassing. I don't want to put that one online, because the Father is speaking about this, this, this whole subject. And so I, as your pastor, cannot say that we preach the book of Proverbs without covering this, this subject. It's, yeah, I'm passionate about it, but I'm not really passionate to speak about it. But we're going to dive in, and I know that the Lord has something for us. You know, the tone of the Father in Proverbs on this issue when it, when it comes to sex reminds me of a story of when I was mowing the lawn with my son. Well, the other day I was mowing my lawn. Well, I wasn't actually mowing, my son was mowing. He was standing right here. He was mowing using this machine and I was right over there and I was using the weed whacker. And normally we have this, this like uh, bag on here where we can put on here and all the grass clippings go in there. But if we don't use that, we use this little vent or shoot or whatever thing. And it goes on the side here and all the grass clippings fall out. I think you guys understand how more works. Anyway. <laughs> When we were mowing, we, we had, he had this on here. And this thing, for some reason, it, it falls off occasionally. And if something hits it, it'll bump off. And we don't want to do that because the whole lawnmower will bog right down with the, with the clippings and stuff. So if it falls off, you need to let your hand off the trigger here and then put it back on and start the mower. Well, we were in a hurry, I guess, that day. And I was over there uh, weed whacking. And out of the corner of my eye, I see my son kind of playing around with the, with the mower. And I don't know what he's doing, and I'm just busy going. And he, the mower's still going, and he has one hand up here. I look over, and out of the corner of my eye, he has, him, he has one hand up here, and this mower is still going. And this has fallen off down here, and he's trying to, you see that? He's trying to put this thing back on here. Meanwhile, 
it's still going and there's a blade just spinning in there. And so I see this, I put this together in like a millisecond and I'm standing right over there and I scream, scared him after that. And I think the whole neighborhood around here who, too, who heard me too. I said, hey, and he just startled. I was like, don't do that. <laughs> Why? Because it's danger, major danger of causing himself harm. He was putting his fingers close to that, that spinning blade. That's why I yelled. You see, you see, when it comes to the subject of sex in the book of Proverbs, the father wants to warn his son about some major harm that can come his way if he doesn't handle it correctly. And when you read the book of Proverbs, you can't hear inflection in the father's voice. You can't hear volume in his voice. But, but judging by the volume or the amount of scripture on this subject, you can see that the father is speaking a loud message to the son. And he condenses it all in kind of one area, pretty much, where the other subjects, he kind of dribs and drabs and drizzles all these little tidbits of information all throughout the book. Here, he kind of condenses, he starts the book off in chapter, chapter five, Chapter 6 and chapter 7 is when he covers this subject. But in Proverbs chapter 4, chapters 5, 6, and 7 is where he covers it. Proverbs chapter 4, before he even gets to this subject, the father outlines two different paths. You probably read it this week if you were doing a chapter a day. He outlines two different paths that are, that, that like at, the, the son is at a crossroad. The son is at a fork in the road and there's two different paths that he can go to, go down. He, he, he says this in, in, in verse number 11 of chapter four, I instruct you in the way of wisdom and lead you along straight paths. And then he says, do not set foot on the path of the wicked. And then he goes on to say that the path of the righteous is the morning sun. And then at the end of the chapter, in chapter four, he says, give careful thought to the paths of your feet. And so there's, there's two paths that the sun can go down. One path is a straight path. In fact, Proverbs chapter three, five, and six, some of our, one of our favorite Proverbs, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. But in Proverbs chapter 4, the very next chapter, there's, there's a straight path. It's unhampered. You're not going to stumble. There's light and it leads to life. But then there's a second path that's aimless, that's dark, and it leads to destruction. And then after Proverbs chapter 4, he jumps into this major theme, sex, in Proverbs chapter 5, after he outlines paths, two, two paths, and he starts talking about this adulterous woman. Now, this adulterous woman is the personification for this son of everything outside of God's plan for sex. Everything outside of, of a husband and a wife staying in a committed relationship, and that's where sex is to be expressed. That's God's plan. That's God's plan for our life. We're going to talk about that. Anything outside of that is called sexual immorality, and it's personified for the son as this adulterous woman, or some translations say a strange woman. And we're going to read this in Proverbs chapter 5. I want you to see which path this strange woman, this adulterous woman, is on. Okay? Proverbs chapter 5, we're going to read this whole chunk. Chapter 5, a little bit of chapter 6, and then chapter 7. It's, it won't take us long, but let's just hear the full argument of the father to the son, and then we'll, we'll unpack it. Okay, Proverbs chapter 5, verse number 1. Follow along with me, or just listen. It says this, my son, pay attention to my wisdom, turn your ear to my words of insight, that you may maintain discretion and your lips may preserve knowledge. For the lips of an adulterous woman drip honey and her speech is smoother than oil. But in the end, she is bitter as gall, sharp as a double-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps lead straight to the grave. She gives no thought to the way of life. Her paths wander aimlessly, but she does not know it. Now then, my son, listen to me. Do not turn aside from what I say. Keep to a path far from her. Do not go near the door of her host, lest you lose your honor to others and your dignity to the one who is cruel. Lest strangers feast on your wealth and your toil enrich your, the host of another. 
At the end of your life, you will groan when your flesh and body are spent. You will say, how I hated discipline, how my heart spurned correction. I would not obey my teachers or turn my ear to instructors, instructors, and I was soon in serious trouble in the assembly of God's people. We'll talk about that. Drink water from your own cistern, running water from your own well. Should your springs overflow in the streets, your streams of water in the public squares, let them be yours alone, never to be shared with strangers. May your fountain be blessed and may you rejoice in the wife of your youth, a loving doe, a graceful deer. May her breast satisfy you always. May you ever be intoxicated with her love. Why, my son, be intoxicated with another man's wife? Why embrace the bosom of a wayward woman? For your ways are in full view of the Lord, and he examines your paths. Huh. He examines your paths. The, the evil deeds of wicked ensnare them, and the cords of their sin hold them fast. For lack of discipline they will die, led astray by their own great folly. And then the father goes on the first part of chapter 6, and he talks about some other subject, but then he comes back to it in the middle of chapter 6, and he covers it at the end of chapter 6 to, into chapter 7. Let's read it. Chapter 6, verse number 20. Let's pick up. My son, keep your father's command and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Bind them always on your heart, fasten them around your neck. When you walk, they will guide you. When you sleep, they will watch over you. When you awake, they will speak to you. For this command is a lamp, huh? We sang that. And this teaching is a light and correction and instruction are the way of life. Keeping you from the neighbor's wife from a smooth talk of a wayward woman. Do not lust in your heart after her beauty or let her captivate you with her eyes. For a prostitute can be had for a loaf of bread, but another man's wife preys on your very life. Can a man scoop up fire into his lap without his clothes being burned? Can a man walk on hot clothes without his feet being scorched? So is he who sleeps with another man's wife. No one who touches her will go unpunished. People do not spot, despise a thief if he steals to satisfy his hunger when he is starving. Yet if he is caught, he must pay back sevenfold, though it costs him all the wealth of his host. But a man who commits adultery has no sense. Whoever does so destroys himself. Blows and disgrace are his lot, and his shame will never be wiped away. For jealousy arouses a husband's fury, and he will show no mercy when he takes revenge." He will not accept any compensation. He will refuse a bribe, however great it is. Chapter 7. Let's read this. Pay attention. My son, keep my words and store up my commands within you. Keep my commands and you will live. Guard my teachings as an apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, you are my sister. To insight, you are my relative. They will keep you from the adulterous woman. From the wayward woman with her seductive words. And then he tells a story. At the window of my house, I looked down through the lattice and I saw the simple. I noticed among the, uh, among the young man a youth who had no sense. He was going down the street near her corner, walking along in the direction of her house, going down that path. At twilight, as the day was fading, as the dark of night set in, then out came a woman to meet him, dressed like a prostitute and with crafty intent. She is unruly and defiant, and her feet never stay at home. Now in the street, now in the squares, at every corner she lurks. She, she took hold of him and kissed him, and with brazen face she said, Today I have fulfilled my vows, and I have food from my fellowship offering at home. So I came out to meet you. I looked for you and found you. I have covered my bed with colored linens from Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, cinnamon. Come, let's drink deeply of love till morning. Let's enjoy ourselves with love. My husband is not at home. He is gone on a long journey. He took his purse filled with money and will not be home till full moon. With persuasive words, she led him astray. She seduced him with her smooth talk. All at once, he followed her like an ox going to a slaughter, like a deer stepping into a noose, till an arrow pierces his liver, like a bird darting into a snare, little knowing it will cost him his life. Now then, my son, listen to me. Pay attention to what I say. Do not let your heart turn to her ways or stray into her paths. Many are the victims she has brought down. Her slain are a mighty throng. Her host is a highway to the grave leading down to the chambers of death. And so the father outlines two paths 
for his son. One leads to life, the other leads to death. I was mountain biking last week down in this area called Bragg Creek and I was down there with my brother and we were doing these things called shuttle runs where we take our our mountain bikes up the mountain like seven or eight kilometers and then we take a trail coming down to where we parked our vehicle and then we take that vehicle up and we get the other vehicle and so we don't have to bike uphill basically. Well, we get to the top of this, this hill and there's the, it's, it's this trailhead. There's one trail that goes this way, kind of north, and there's this other trail that goes south. It's on this kind of peak of this mountain. One goes way over here and one goes way over here. And I was with some guys and I was kind of leading them because I had been there before and they wanted to jump on this one trail. And I was like, wait, he's like, no, 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 no. Don't go on that trail. That trail is about seven kilometers long. That's going to take you way, but probably about six kilometers away from our car at the bottom. We want to go on this trail because at the bottom of this trail is where we want to go. This is where our vehicle is. We don't want to do any more pedaling than we, than we have to. And so the father outlines two trails for his son. Two paths for his son. One, he says, is going to take you where you want to go. The other one's going to take you to a distant place where you really don't want to go. And so he, he outlines some, some things for the son on how to stay on this, this path of what we call sexual purity for the son. And he, ha- he speaks to him, making a number of points. There's two obvious points here. The first obvious point that the father wants to make to his son about this topic on sex is, is in, it's in chapter 5, and it's this. It's that, that God's sexual path for you brings satisfaction. God is for your joy. God is for your joy. God's sexual path for you is for your satisfaction. Uh, when, I was, when I was a youth pastor, uh, obviously, I'd, I, I'd always speak on the subject of sex to kids. Uh, every year, there was like, usually in the month of February, I would schedule off some time where we're going we're gonna to tackle this topic of sex, and for obvious reasons, because this is the, the time where, where, where they're starting to battle this for the very first time. And uh, I'll, I'll never forget when I was speaking on this, this was the time where I had almost the whole youth group just angry at me. I mean, livid at me. It's because I was doing this object lesson. And and here's what I did. I found this online, so it wasn't my original idea. But anyway, here's what I did. Uh, I I went to the pet store and I I bought a goldfish in a bowl. And I brought this table up on speaking to the youth and I with this with and put this bowl on there with the goldfish, had a blanket over it, so it was kind of this mysterious. Took the blanket off, and I'm like, oh, look, this is Sam. He's our goldfish. He's our, he's our, he's our mascot for the, for the youth group now. Isn't everyone, everyone say hi, Sam. They love, everyone, don't we love Sam? We're going to take care of Sam. Sam's amazing. And so then I said, today we're going to talk about sex. And so right as I was about to talk about it, I, I reach into the, goal, into the bowl, I take out the goldfish, and I put them right on the table. And he's flopping around, he's flopping around. And then I start talking about, you know, how Sam was just confined to this bowl. And we need to, we need, we need to free Sam from all this constraints of this horrific bowl that he has to stay within. There's such a big, vast world out there that he can explore. He can go to mountains. He can, he can drive across the country. He can go see things he's never seen before. But he's confined to this tiny little bowl. Let's free him. Let's take him out. So I took him out. And I was talking about... God's plan for sex and as I'm talking and this fish is just flopping around (laughs) on the table these kids and the youth leaders I didn't warn the youth leaders they were getting angry at me oh man they were getting angry at me like and some kids were starting to run up on stage to to put this fish back in the bowl and finally I put it back in the bowl and I said what was my point in all this my point is that God has given us parameters he's given us boundaries for these things for our good when it comes to sex, we step outside of that. We can't breathe. It's going to cause us a lot of harm. But we stay within those boundaries. It's for our good. God has designed sex to be a very satisfying thing between a husband and a wife in a lifelong marriage relationship. And so he talks about this. The father talks about this. In Proverbs chapter 5, verse number 15. And he starts talking about water, but then, you know, he's a little implicit 
he's talking metaphorically and then it's like the son doesn't quite get it and then and then the father says, well, I need to be a little more explicit. He, 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 he's like, uh, uh, drink water from your own cistern. Okay, dad, we're talking about water. Don't drink water from somebody else's well. Okay, yeah. Enjoy the, uh, should your springs overflow in the streets, your streams into the public squares, let them be yours alone. Okay, yeah. May they be, may your fountain be blessed. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll drink water from my own cistern here. Thanks, thanks, dad. And it's like the father doesn't, he knows the son's not quite getting it. Just to be, I was a little too implicit there. I need to be explicit. And then he goes, goes on, he goes, uh, may her breast satisfy you always. And he says, why embrace the bosom of a wayward woman? Okay, water means breasts and bosom. Okay, we're, that's what we're talking about, dad. Okay, I get it now. I get it now. And if you want a more explicit description of this physical sexual relationship between a husband and wife, go over just a, 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 a book or two, Proverbs, uh, Song of Solomon, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, two books over. And that was traditionally called the handbook to marriage for the Jewish people. And in fact, it was so erotic that they wouldn't let young boys read this younger before they, they hit puberty. God has designed sex for our joy. I mean, you just read the book of Psalm, Song of Solomon and, and you see that. I mean, back up even further to this, to, to the Garden of Eden. Eden means playground of delight. And the very first command that he gives the man and the woman in the garden before sin even entered into the world is go and be fruitful and multiply. And it turns out that that's a pretty fun command to obey. And I've said this before when we talked about this in the Elephant in the Room series when we talked on sex. Remember, we were sexual before we were sinful. Sex was created before sin. It was part of God's original intent for our joy in the Garden of Delight, in the Garden of Eden. And we need to remember that in the church because sometimes we can think, think sex is this dirty word because the world has put so much filth on this thing, but it's not. It's this beautiful thing to be expressed between a husband and wife for our joy. I was, uh, I was at a pastor's retreat many years ago, just a small little pastor's retreat, about 20 pastors, and we were talking about issues that pastors face. And, and for some reason, we, we talked about going through very difficult times in ministry. And everyone was kind of sharing their thoughts uh, about how we can get through di very difficult times in ministry. It was, it was a great time. And I'll never forget, there was this older, wiser pastor that basically everyone in us in the room looked up to. Like, he, you know, he was kind of the sage that we, we would have looked to for, and when he spoke, we all kind of listened. And, and he's the one that spoke at, at the end. And he says, those, those are all good things, but he says, at, after that difficult time is over, he, so he, he spoke and everyone listened. He says, after that difficult time is over, he, he says, go home and make love to your wife. And it was like, awkward pause and and then like literally for a few seconds like we weren't expecting that but I do like that <laughs> and, and then the silence was broken by one, one of my pastor friends he said and again I say rejoice <laughs> because he said that there's this one flesh there's this mingling of souls which one flesh means this mingling of souls that happens that 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 that, that you after you go through a time of depletion that that fuels you up Physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, there's this deeper thing that's happening when a man and a woman have sex. So the father says to his son, God's sexual path brings satisfaction. Despite what the, statistic, despite what the world says, the statistics say this that people with the most satisfying sex lives are monogamous, heterosexual, married couples who have had few or no partners before marriage. But yet the people who report the lowest levels of sexual satisfaction are promiscuous singles with frequent sexual encounters. Over and over, the polls say that. Over and over, the stats say that. You're not going to hear that from any talk show, from any news media, from every TV show out there. But reality is so far removed from what the world is promoting. God's plan for you, God's plan for you 
God's sexual path for you brings satisfaction. But adversely, as you could probably tell when we read Proverbs, the opposite is true. The world's sexual path brings destruction. And here's why. It's aimless and it doesn't even know it. The path that the world says that you're supposed to go on for sex is completely aimless. Listen to what he says about this, this adulteress, which is the personification of sexual immorality, the world's message. It says this, her feet go down to the death, her steps lead straight to the grave, she gives no thought to the way of life, her paths wander aimlessly, and she does not know it. You see, the world is screaming two different messages, two opposing messages to you about this idea of sex. And I've said this before in the Elephant in the Room series, but I'm just going to remind us again. On one side, they say that sex isn't not a big deal. It's not a big deal. It's just like harmless recreation, just like playing frisbee or playing chess with someone or going for a walk. It's, it's not a big deal. But then on the other side, they say it is a big deal. They lock people up in prison for, for forcing that recreation on someone? The Me Too movement? Why is the Me Too movement for forcing someone to play, play frisbee? So on one side, they're saying it's called cognitive dissonance, having two completely opposing ideas, and they want them to be true. They say sex isn't a big deal, and they say sex is a big deal. I mean, this is obvious. Uh, I even talked about this in the Elephant in the Room series with this commercial by Gillette. And I'm going to name it. Gillette that makes the razors and the deodorant and, and stuff. They, a couple of years ago, about, about a year ago, they, they put out this commercial. And it, at that time, the Me Too movement was big. And, and the women were coming out saying that men had abused them. And, 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 and it's important that they, they, they have the opportunity to do that. But they were, they were bashing men for doing this in this commercial of Gillette, which was, they were, <laughs> Gillette was speaking two messages, one out of the side of their mouth this way and one out of the side of their mouth this way. You can't tell me, Gillette, that you haven't used sex to sell. And now you're, you're bashing these, these men for actually doing the very thing that you're enticing? That's like standing outside of Weight Washers with a cheeseburger, enticing people to say, don't you want it, don't you want it? And then after they eat it, they just, you just mock them for it. There's two completely opposite ideas that the world wants to tell you about this thing called sex, that it isn't a big deal. It's just simple recreation, two consenting adults. But on the other side of the de uh, other side, it is a big deal. It is a big deal. You have people in counseling years later because they forced someone forced them to play frisbee. Really? The Bible says that it is a big deal. And that's why it puts parameters. That's why it puts a fishbowl around it. Because it's, it's meant to be expressed in a certain way. And as you step outside of that, and there's a lot of consequences. Just, just look at the laundry list of consequences here. There's a few in chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. He goes, lest you lose your honor and your dignity to the one who's who. Lest strangers feast on your wealth. Your honor and your dignity. We all know people who have who have fallen in this regard, and we just go, ah, oh, Christian and non-Christian. It's going to cost you money. Nobody wins in divorce. Nobody wins in divorce. In chapter, verse number 11, he goes on, and he says, at the end of your life, you will groan when your flesh and your body are spent. He said, oh, I hated discipline. Now oh, my heart spurned correction. You're going to have this self-hatred and this shame that's going to eat you up on the inside your whole life and you're going to get the end of your life and you're going to be like, ah, why did I make those decisions? Verse 14, it says, and I was soon in serious trouble in the assembly of God's people. You're going to live this double life always in the church and you're thinking, oh, I hope that they don't find out. I hope that they don't find out. That's going to eat you up. It's going to eat you up. You're going to be, I'm in trouble in the assembly of the Lord's people. Let's keep going. Verse chapter 6, verse 33, it says, Blows of disgrace are his lot, and his shame will never be wiped out. Again, there's just, there's just, so, there, this one has so much weight attached to it. In verse 34, he talks about, For jealousy arouses a husband's fury, and he will show no mercy when he takes revenge. He will not accept any compensation. He will refuse a bribe, however great it is. You are going to tick somebody off. And you're going to tick them off big time that no amount of money is going to be able to get you out of that situation. 
Last year, there was a story that came out of Texas. A father catches a man raping his five-year-old daughter in the act. He grabs the man, and every man could probably identify with the rage that would happen, and that verse right there, and he pounds a snot at him so much so that he's on the brink of death. He calls 911. He's like, oh, no, send someone. This guy's going to die. The man ends up dying. He goes to court for homicide. He gets acquitted. <laughs> He gets acquitted. He, no charges were laid. Can you imagine? No charges were laid in that. Because I think we can understand the rage. You're going to tick somebody off. You're going to tick somebody off if you don't get this under control. And it may cost you your life. He says this, you know, you can, you can forgive someone if they steal something. Yeah, somebody goes in, in verse number, chap, chapter 6, verse number 30, says, people do not despise a thief if he steals to satisfy his hunger. And if he's caught, he pays, okay, yeah, you know, if they steal something, they steal something out of your garage, they steal a shovel, they steal your bicycle, you're like, ugh. But you steal that, you steal that thing from someone in your family, whew, whew. The rage, I think we, all men can identify with that. And he says this, can a man scoop up fire in his lap without being burned? Next time you're at a campfire, try it. Get someone to take a shovel of coals and throw it on your lap and see if you can't be burned. The answer is obvious there. It's going to cause destruction. It's going to cause damage in your life. So there's this one story but my past that I experienced, not, uh, let me explain. There's this one story, when I was back in grade nine, I went to a Christian school up until grade nine, kindergarten to grade nine. My, I went to a Christian school that my grandfather helped build, literally with his own two hands and his heart. And when I hit to grade nine, there was a metaphorical, spiritual Hiroshima bomb that just set off in the whole place. There were multiple leaders that just, it just, it was exposed that they were, this one guy was abusing all of these girls, there's another guy who was having affairs on his wife, and there's another guy, it, it, was, it was just this vortex of, of, of just sexual sin, and it was, it, it was a mess. This was over 25 years, this is over a quarter of a century ago. Uh, 25 years, when I, back when I, back when I was in grade nine, but you know what? To this day, I still meet people who, friends who I was with during that time. And when we meet, when we connect, it's like, I don't know what it's like to go to war, but it's like, it's like soldiers reuniting, I think. It's like soldiers reuniting after like they've been at war and like, it's kind of like the Legion. You know, like they have this common bond, it's like we survived that. And that's what it's like. There was just devastation in the whole organization and in the whole, not just in the individuals themselves, but in the people that they abused and, in the, and the people that walked away from their faith. And, the, and, 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 and even now, I just carry with that over 25 years later, just like, ah, oh, what was that? It's going to cause more damage than you ever thought possible, son. So stay away. There's two times in this in this whole section where we read, where the father says, listen, my son. It's like he grabs the son by the shoulders and he says, listen, listen, listen. He says this. Keep to a path far from her. Do not let your heart turn to her ways or stray near her paths. Keep to a path far from her. Both times when he says that, he's like he's grabbing the son by the shoulder and he says, don't go near her path. Don't go near her path. Why? Because this one thing, like the, Paul, the Apostle Paul explains in, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, he says, he who sins sexually sins against himself. It's in a category all to itself. It's in a, it's in a category all to itself. If you, if you mess up in this area, there's not that much consequence. You mess up in your finances, it's like, okay. You mess up in this line, okay. But you mess up in this, there is a whole new category of consequences that it's in the category all to itself. You know, we all want to know where the line is when it 
when we're driving our car, we want to know what the speed limit is. And we're not going to go way under the speed limit. We want to go right up to the speed limit and not go past it. When, when you're a young person and you have a curfew, you want to know, what is my curfew? It's 11 o'clock. We're not going to come home an hour early. We're going to come into the parking lot just screeching our tires, just like 10.59 if it's 11 o'clock. If we're on a diet, we want to know what's our, what is the line? Where's our calorie line? We're not going to eat half of our calories. We're going to go right up to the line and not, not far. Hey, but, but here's the thing. We all want to know where the line is. We all want to know where the line is. The speed limit or a curfew or a calories. You cross that line with the speed limit, there's not major consequences. You cross that line with the curfew, there's not real major consequences that you're going to be dealing with the rest of your life. Or calories, you, you can make it up later. But when you cross this line when it comes to sexual morality, whew, there's consequences. Just ask King David. Even though he sinned with Bathsheba, even though he sinned with Bathsheba, there were still consequences. And many of you may be able to attest to that. So, so he says, stay away from the line. Stay away from the cliff. Or to mix illustrations, keep your fingers far away from the lawnmower blade. Hey, listen to me. Stay from her path. Stay away from her path. The final thing that the father wants to say to his son about sex is that staying on God's sexual path for you is a matter of your heart. Staying on God's path is a matter of the heart. That's why he says in, in, in chapter 4 when he's explaining these two paths, you can go down this path which leads to life or this path that leads to destruction, he says, above all else guard your hell, heart for everything you do flows from it. It's a matter of your heart. It needs to be a heart, for us in the New Testament, <clears throat> a heart that is pursuing Christ. A heart where, where Christ is at the center and he gives us all of the, all of, all of the affections that we need to, to follow in the path of righteousness. Um, th this past week, uh, uh, we got this interesting order from Staples. Uh, now, we order as a church many things from Staples, office supplies. And because we order so many things from Staples, we get these points that build up, I guess. And we get free things. And there's this list we can choose from of, of free things that we can get. And so, Manik, our, 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 our office admin, said oh, she had to pick between some things that were free. And so, we now have a free pressure washer. Because it was free. Because we got it through Staples. So now, and we, and we thought, what on earth are we going to do with a pressure washer? And so we kind of joked this week, uh, Pastor Josh and, and, and Manik and myself were standing around saying, well, let's, I know what we could do in this COVID-19 thing. We could, we could put this, this pressure washer just outside of the office door, lock all the doors, and anyone that wants to enter the building, Manik can just stand there and just hose them off with the pressure washer and just peel a layer of skin off, but to keep all the germs and stuff outside side of the church. That's what we can use it for. We're obviously tongue in cheek about that. But, but even if we did that, we all know that you can bring the virus in if it's inside of you. That won't work. And when it comes to staying on the path of sexual purity, if we try to just fix the outside, if we just try to just clean the outside, just clean up our actions without fixing the inside, curing the inside, it's not going to work. I mean, Jesus even accused the Pharisees of this, cleaning the outside of the dish, but inside is full of greed and self-indulgence. It doesn't matter if you try to look good on the outside, if inside your heart is still longing towards the world's sexual path. That's why you need to have a heart on the inside, not just outward actions, you need to have a heart on the inside that where your affections are on Christ. When you read the book of Proverbs, and as you're reading a chapter a day for a, a, a month, you need to read it through a certain lens, especially because now we have the New Testament. Every time it says the word wisdom, put the word Christ. Because Christ in the New Testament is our wisdom. That's it, called reading the Old Testament with a Christological lens. Christ is our 
wisdom. I mean, that's obvious when you get to Proverbs chapter 8, the very next chapter, which we didn't read, which is all talking about Christ. It's all, it's all prophesying Christ. And so he says in chapter 2, he says this, wisdom or Christ will save you from the adulterous woman. He, sa he said, say to wisdom, you are my sister, and to insight, you are my relative. They will keep you from the adulterous woman. Get into a personal relationship, not just with the concept of with it, wisdom, but of the person of Jesus Christ. And let him change your heart on the inside. My favorite proverb is this. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 7. It's so simple. It says this. The beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom. The beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom. Though it costs all that you have, get wisdom. Get Christ. Don't have this lackadaisical approach to, yeah, yeah, I think it's important. No, get wisdom. I need to get wisdom. I need to get Christ. Pursue Christ. Have this relentless pursuit of Christ with your life. That needs to be at your heart. Not just cleaning the outside. Not just pressure washing the outside and trying to clean up your actions. Your heart needs to be on Christ to stay on that path. The beginning of the wisdom is this, get wisdom. Because it is Christ that produces that right living inside of us. So there's this video that I, I shared on Facebook. And it, it, I said, I wanna play this sport. It's this sport I'd never heard of before and I had to do a little research as to what it was. It's this, it's this called Japanese capture the flag. It's, it's what the Jap some of the Japanese actually use in, in some of their military training. There's like 150 people on either side. And there's, there's a bit of a video here. There's, there's like 75 people on the offense, 75 people on defense, and there's this man on a pole right here. And one team is trying desperately to get this guy off this pole, and the other team is trying to push them away and push them away. And I was like, man, I want to do that. That just, just describes my spiritual life, especially when it comes to this issue. It's, Get wisdom. Get it. Get it. Man, these guys are just like running after that pull. I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it. And the world is going to try and push us away. The world's going to try and push us away from Christ. It's going to try to push us away from God's plan for our life. But we need that attitude that I am going to get it. I'm going to get Christ. The beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom. You see, many Christians... Many Christians live their life just kind of lackadaisical. And if, when it comes to this issue, and if you saw the video there, some of these guys, I was researching this, some of these guys are taxed with just grabbing as defense, grabbing someone on the opponents, and just kind of putting them in a bear hug, wrapping their arms and legs around them, and just laying on the ground, and just putting them in this vice. And if we approach this subject kind of running at that pole, just kind of like, eh, Eh, I'll come in, well, I, uh, I want Christ. I think I want Christ. The world's path is going to put us in a vice and it's going to hold on to us. But if we seek Christ in a personal relationship with Him and we give, He gives us a new heart, it's a matter of the heart, and we're going to pursue Christ with everything, and no matter what the world throws at us and trying to push us away from God's plan for our life, we're going to get it. Following God's path is a matter of the heart. We need, this, we need this relentless pursuit, this tenacity that we want Christ. Is that your heart? Now, I'm sure that as we've been going through this, many of you start, are starting to feel some guilt because you've maybe messed up in this regard, in this area of wisdom. But I want to close by leading us in a prayer that's going to bring us back to the pursuit of Christ, back to the path towards Christ. And it's a prayer that, that King David prayed after he messed up in this regard and it caused some damage in his life, but he, he restored his relationship with Christ. He got back onto his relationship with the Lord. And he wrote these words that get him back on the path. Psalm 51. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgression. 
Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgression and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful from birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you're, you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will turn back to you. Save me from blood guilt, O God, the God who saves, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifices or I bring it. You do not delight in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. Let's remember the father's advice to his son. God's sexual path brings satisfaction. The world's path brings destruction. Keep on a path far from the world's, but staying on God's path is a matter of the heart. It's a matter of a heart that pursues Christ. Let's pray. God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for an opportunity to open your word. Thank you that it is a light unto our path. Give us the strength with Christ to stay on that path. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Blessings on your day.